We will now ask Commissioner Lash to present the recommendations of the Disposal Subcommittee. Uh, we understand that Commissioner Hagel had a long-standing commitment on the West Coast, and he regrets that he cannot join us today. We'd like to extend a special thanks to Commissioners Lash and Hagel because of their subcommittee volunteered to dig deeply into several of the key cross-cutting issues facing the Commission, including the facility siting process, the roles of tribal, state, and local governments, the governance of the waste management program, and funding considerations. These are all very big issues, and we thank you and your subcommittee for your work. So Jonathan, please proceed. Madam Chair, thank you. And uh, Senator Hagel did ask me to communicate to all of the members of the commission that he really very badly <coughs> wants to be part of this and strongly believes in this set of recommendations. <coughs> Uh, most of, uh, I think aside from Senator Hagel, all of the members of our subcommittee are, are present here and, and I'm grateful to all of you for your work. I will aspire to achieve the level of clarity uh, that Commissioner Meserve and Commissioner Sharp achieved in presenting uh, their recommendations. Uh, absolutely. I do want to uh, offer a couple of uh, cautions before I get into the recommendations. Uh, this uh, draft um, is a very good reflection by the staff of a set of discussions among uh, the commissioners over a period of uh, eight months, um, but it isn't a finished work. Um, first of all, it does not reflect all of the comments of the members of the subcommittee after the draft was prepared. We simply haven't had time to incorporate all of those comments, let alone the com comments of other members of the commission. Um, secondly, there is still some ongoing uh, work that we are having done uh, to help us answer some of the questions about structures of the new entity that we recommend and, and so forth. In a sense, that's good because it offers us both the opportunity to get your comments and particularly to respond to public comments. Um, we know we have further work to do and we want to do that in light of the comments we get from the commissioners and from the public. We do recommend a set of uh, changes that will require statutory action and I'll try to be mindful of uh, what several of you said that we ought to be clear where we're making those recommendations uh, because they will require both time and significant effort to achieve. Okay. I'm um, sure it is if I knew. There we go. Uh, the members of our committee. We had one fundamental question to answer uh, since it was the disposal committee. Um, how do we go about establishing appropriate facilities for disposal of high level wastes and how do we do that within a time frame and in a manner uh, that is feasible economically and technically but also politically and socially, socially uh, acceptable. Um, we looked at that in terms of uh, is there any scenario under which a disposal facility would not be needed and uh, what could we understand about the processes that were most likely to result in uh, successful siting after, um, John, how did you describe it, uh, 50 years of broken promises. We have not mastered the technology. <laughs> what, what makes it confusing is it works sometimes. <laughs> um, I, I, I think when Pavlov did those experiments, the, the, the most effective training was when you kept the dogs confused, right? Um, we had uh, a number of open 
uh, sessions. Uh, we heard from a long list of, of witnesses. We had a number of closed deliberative sessions. Uh, some members of the subcommittee participated in a classified uh, briefing. Uh, we also made trips to see uh, facilities both in the United States and in Europe and in Japan. Uh, I think we were particularly struck by what we saw in Finland and in Sweden and, and uh, members of the uh, committee were also influenced by the successful operation uh, that they saw at WIP in New Mexico. Um, in each of the cases where we uh, visited a facility, we went out of our way to meet not only with uh, officials but with representatives of the industry and representatives of the communities and interested uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, first uh, recommendation uh, is an unequivocal answer to the first part of the main question. We do need disposal under any uh, set of uh, circumstances that we can imagine we will need disposal. There is no scenario under which the United States will not have substantial amounts of high-level waste to dispose of, even if we change our strategy with regard to the operation or expansion or contraction of the industry, even if technology changes and we move toward reprocessing, we will still need uh, permanent disposal for substantial amounts of high-level waste and um, although we looked at a variety of alternative uh, means of disposal, uh, as of now, a uh, talking about digging deeply, a geologic uh, disposal, a mined repository is the most promising, uh, the best accepted. It is the option on which there's the most information. It is the option uh, which is moving ahead in those countries that uh, are moving most quickly toward uh, establishment of a long-term repository. Um, we also uh, felt it important to make the point that there is uh, an ethical obligation to disposal. The United States has benefited from uh, both the creation of electricity uh, from reactors that created some portion of the wastes and also from the security uh, that uh, we got uh, from the production of weapons that generated other portions of the wastes. It, it is our waste. Uh, it is largely in our generation that these wastes were created. Um, and we have an obligation, uh, therefore, to provide for the safe disposal of the wastes as, as best we can. Um, in this context, nothing that we uh, have seen from Fukushima suggests um, any change in that sense of obligation. Um, if anything, it makes it appear more urgent that we move ahead with the creation of uh, a permanent mind uh, repository. So uh, before I leave this recommendation, I just want to be unequivocal here. We, we um, endorse the, the recommendations of the Storage and Disposal Committee, but those recommendations, as Commissioner Sharp said, do not in any way vitiate the need for long-term disposal. Is there really a magical person who, if I, yeah, that's it, okay. Um, second, and another very uh, important uh, recommendation, um, uh, as uh, mentioned by Commissioner Sharp um, earlier, uh, we recommend the creation of a new single purpose uh, entity. Um, to take responsibility for the uh, siting uh, and operation of a waste facility and the responsibility for the creation of interim storage and, and uh, oversight of the transportation of uh, wastes. Um, we reached that conclusion um, 
because we think uh, that a single purpose entity is most likely to be successful in achieving uh, this mission. Um, it is a difficult position that we've put the Department of Energy in as a generator of waste responsible for technology research to promote uh, the industry and think of the path forward and uh, trying to uh, create a waste repository. Um, other countries have uh, taken a different path in, in relying on a single purpose entity. Uh, we think that would be beneficial. Secondly, we think that it is most likely that a new single purpose entity can uh, develop uh, the culture that I'll describe in a moment uh, of uh, transparency, inclusion, uh, engagement um, that we think is essential to build trust in order to have the best hope of successfully citing uh, a facility. Um, and uh, that uh, such an agency uh, can begin to develop the relationships that will be necessary to make and have communities rely on long-term commitments uh, surrounding a repository that is designed uh, to be safe for hundreds of thousands of years. <clears throat> we think it is that the precise form of the entity is less important than uh, the approach that it takes. Although we've done a good deal of work looking at examples that exist within uh, the federal government now, like the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, other um, independent uh, federal uh, corporations, uh, we would emphasize that the most important aspects are not so much the structure as the attributes of the organization, um, including particularly a commitment to transparency, uh, to uh, full-scale uh, ongoing participation by all affected interests, uh, to responsiveness to uh, the concerns of communities um, state agencies, local agencies, uh, civil society organizations, to accountability uh, for its actions and ability to uh, maintain uh, and live up to commitments, uh, to uh, the underlying notion that building trust and confidence is as important a part of the process as technical excellence. Technical excellence is essential uh, but it won't accomplish the purpose without trust uh, and confidence. And we think all of that can be built around an organization that has a strong uh, mission orientation. Uh, we have a number of recommendations about uh, how uh, the entity will go about its process. I'll come to those a little later. We think it would be important for it to set up uh, a widely representative siting council uh, of course, its relationship with uh, state, local, regional, and tribal government will be important. I'll get to that uh, a little uh, later. Um, there will be in important questions about the role of congressional oversight with regard uh, to this entity. Obviously, Congress has the responsibility to assure that this program is operated in a way that protects the interests of the American people and their safety. And uh, to intervene if this entity uh, begins to uh, diverge from its statutory mandate and its mission. At the same time, it has to be able to make very long commitments and live up to them. And so constant political intervention is entirely inconsistent with that. Um, we are working on how you define a level of oversight that achieves that obligation of protecting the safety and interests of the American people without resulting in the kind of constant interference that makes it impossible for an agency to make hard decisions. On this, I particularly wish that Senator Hagel were here because he has very strong 
views and is quite cogent um, on this issue. Um, but without access to the funds, which I'll talk about in a moment, and without the ability to operate with general congressional approval and make long-term plans, none of this can work. The, the rest of it um, really becomes quite irrelevant. Um, the last uh, relatively minor point about this entity, um, <clears throat> we view it as primarily an operating entity, not a research entity. There would be some research issues on other forms of disposal um, that it ought to have responsibility for. Um, but in terms of the rest of the back end of the fuel cycle, that should remain with DOE, uh, not be part of the responsibility of, of this organization. So number three, look at that. Money. Uh, I can only reiterate what Commissioner Sharp said earlier. Um, the producers of waste, really the consumers of electricity, have paid and are paying uh, for the disposal of waste. The program committed to execute that disposal of waste has not had consistent or adequate access to the funds that are paid there by the producers of waste. The reasons are complicated. Um, we've done quite a good deal of work on how that happened and the set of decisions that led to that, and I'm not going to talk about them because I'll get confused. Um, but this, the recommendation is relatively simple. Um, Congress should make changes that assure that the new entity has access to those funds so it can operate um, in a predictable manner, and there is the opportunity for the administration uh, through executive action to reverse some of the most serious decisions that limit the access of the entity to the waste fund. There is a very good paper on how that could be done, essentially by a set of decisions by the Office of Management and Budget, which will be posted on the website soon. Um, and I suggest that members of the Commission may want to look. This, this is about money. Um, it does have an impact on the federal budget, the, the set of decisions that we would urge the administration to make. But it would be an enormous gesture of good faith and of conviction on the part of the administration that they wanted to move ahead with a robust program to create uh, both interim storage and, and disposal uh, facilities. Um, but just to emphasize again, the current situation isn't working. It, it doesn't provide consistent funding. We have to do something about that in addition to creating sufficient authorities, as Commissioner Moniz pointed out, uh, for the new entity to be able to operate. <clears throat> Recommendation four is about how we would like the new entity to approach its task. Um, and it is a distillation both of the experience of the past 50 years and of what we saw in Finland and Sweden uh, in discussing uh, the issue uh, with uh, our colleagues from Canada. Um, we believe that siting is most likely to succeed, and, and, and John um, has said repeatedly to us what he said earlier this morning, that um, uh, some of these recommendations uh, cause some concern, but they seem necessary to create a successful siting process. We believe that a community chosen for a site should be able to decide to withdraw from the process, that this has to be consent-based. That that consent is most likely to be secured if the process is entirely transparent. Transparent beyond just information is there and to the point of actively trying to make information available, help people understand what the issues are. Um, everything we have learned suggests that it is important that the process be a learning process. That's essentially what we mean by phased and adaptive, that it be possible to make decisions over a sequence of time and, 
and learn from each stage uh, what might contribute to making the next stage uh, more effective. And finally, it has to work according to um, established um, general, not site-specific, science-based standards um, that are understandable and available to all of the participants in the process. That is, the rules have to be clear. And the rules have to be general, not created for specifically one site or one purpose. Um, we noted uh, that uh, when the commission visited Carlsbad, when, when we had conversations with those involved in the WIP process, there was a general agreement that uh, the process had been sufficiently open that all of the players thought that they knew what they needed to know to make informed decisions, uh, that funding was available for uh, state agencies uh, in order to be able to effectively oversee the process, and um, that the state was given a role as a regulator as it would have under uh, EPA statutes uh, applicable to other facilities as well. And that, that arrangement in which the state was a regulator, uh, the process was transparent, everyone had the capacity to participate, seems to have led uh, to a good outcome. Uh, I missed one thing I wanted to uh, say with regard to this uh, recommendation. Um, one of the most difficult issues is thinking about the role of state uh, and tribal governments in this process. Um, it's clear that they have both uh, capacity uh, and reason to uh, participate effectively and they should have um, a forum through which they can actively engage in a set of decisions around siting and design. At the same time, we do not recommend the creation of a state veto. While we think local communities should be in a position to withdraw from the process if they choose. Uh, we think that it's more effective for states and tribes to have a regulatory role than have a veto and that um, the pressures on states to exercise a veto if they have a veto may simply be too great. Um, we hope uh, to get comments uh, from states and, and local governments and tribes um, on our draft. We, we have not, we, we don't have a clear set of recommendations uh, from those entities uh, yet. Um, we're trying to fashion something that, that workably and fairly reflects uh, the responsibilities of uh, state governments and communities but still retains a process that might lead to successful siting. Um, the current arrangement, as uh, we all uh, heard in testimony before the full commission, I think last summer, is uh, that uh, EPA uh, issues uh, performance standards and NRC uh, makes a set of uh, key uh, regulatory design uh, decisions. It, it is a divided responsibility that I would say personally initially struck me as not very efficient. Um, and I, our subcommittee ended up after spending quite a good deal of time looking at this saying it may not be very efficient but we actually can't think of anything better. Um, it seems workable. The NRC has enormous technical expertise that is appropriately uh, uh, applied to the specific licensing decisions that will be necessary for 
uh, licensing of a, a deep geologic repository. Um, the EPA uh, has long experience and effective processes for the development of broad performance uh, standards. Um, and we think that arrangement can be made to work and can be made to work, in fact, better than it has in the past um, if there's more coordination mandated between the agencies, if uh, to the extent possible uh, they rely on regulatory negotiation, um, and if they effectively uh, use uh, advisory committees uh, to oversee the process. We also uh, would note that um, current regulation is not sufficient. The, the current rules were created for a specific purpose and it will be necessary to go back and create site independent uh, safety standards. Um, and we think that that can be done consistently with the pace at which it will be possible to move forward to create a new agency uh, and begin to collect information on sites, but it needs to be done promptly. We heard a number of recommendations um, in this area, but the ones we found most compelling were those that, that suggested that um, a negotiated process and the application of the principles of transparency would be effective uh, in moving ahead in this area. This is going back to the uh, specifics of the roles of uh, tribal government, state government, local uh, governments. Um, this recommendation is not as specific as we would like ultimately to be with your help. Um, and uh, it, this decision, as I said earlier, will be key to the workability um, and also acceptability of the standard. Um, much of it will depend on the extent to which the new entity uh, develops an effective relationship with affected uh, state, uh, local, and, and tribal uh, governments. Uh, again, uh, if the rules are clear and consistent, if the process is sufficiently open and inclusive, we believe uh, that this arrangement can be made to work. All levels of government have to feel that they will have a full opportunity to represent the interests of the people who have chosen them um, in participating in, in the process. Um, Finally, we wanted to be clear that we think the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board is a valuable uh, source of technical advice and independent review. We would like, if anything, to see it strengthened um, and to assure that uh, its membership reflects a broad range of professional uh, skills and expertise um, and uh, that its mandate uh, is clear that it is to be independent um, and uh, that will uh, help the new entity in operating effectively. It will be useful to them, not uh, an interference, uh, to have a set of uh, expert uh, uh, independent critics uh, of its uh, work. Um, we have not uh, again, in this area, it may be that we will come up with more specific uh, recommendations based on your comments. Th that was a quick r rendition of 130 pages of recommendations and hundreds of hours of work by my colleagues on the committee um, and uh, the members of the staff. L let me just close with, with one addition. We fairly quickly coalesced around the essence of these recommendations. That is, uh, the need for disposal, uh, deep geologic disposal, a new entity, a new 
process uh, that is open, inclusive, and, and consent-based. Um, there's a great deal of detail surrounding those recommendations, and it, it, we have a lot of work to do still on that detail. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lash. Um, we will use the same process that we used earlier with members of your subcommittee uh, asking questions and then the fellow uh, commissioners expanding it from there. Uh, and I'm going to open it with the first question. Um, and I think Commissioner uh, Moniz mentioned it earlier, and that's the issue of defense and civilian waste. Uh, and I know we did talk about that. Um, uh, the issue of, of commingling it or not commingling it, uh, and I'd like to hear the views of, of your of your thoughts, Commissioner Lass, and, and those on your subcommittee as to that issue. Um, Madam Chair, as you know, um, having sat through these discussions, we discussed the issue. I'm not sure we reached a clear uh, conclusion, um, and I certainly don't feel technically well enough informed yet to reach a conclusion. Uh, I know a number of members of the subcommittee have, have strong views, and I've read comments from uh, non-subcommittee uh, members as well. So we know we have to go back and dig into this one again. And I think it's the, the thought maybe of the, the real two co-chairs that they would like the uh, disposal committee to, to look at that issue and maybe come back, uh, do a little deeper dive into that, and come back and, and give us, uh, uh, investigate that matter maybe over the next few months and report back in the fall. All right. All right. Uh, other, other comments, questions? Uh, all right. I've got to take these. <laughs> i got to get to work here. Okay. Pair. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you. I, I have one general observation and then three, three specific uh, questions. The first is just to note that when we entered into this process, I was actually skeptical that voluntary processes could work. I thought that we would likely be in a position of having something that look, would look like base reauthorization and closure type of process. I can report that based on the opportunities to travel to Finland, to Sweden, to other parts of the United States to discuss with people that I am now quite confident that if we enter into this type of process that it is likely to be successful uh, and that it is likely to generate much better outcomes. In particular, if we note that by developing in parallel both some consolidated interim storage and disposal capabilities that we're not going to stuff the entire problem onto a single state and isolate them as the only state carrying the entire burden. And I think that if we, if we do that, that, that I have confidence that we can be successful. And I did not come into this process believing that. So I think that it's important to note that, that um, uh, my thoughts on that have changed. I have, I have three specific points to, to raise. The first is on this question of defense versus civil wastes. Uh, I had a chance to speak with Commissioner Moniz a little bit after this, and, and I don't think that people here want to have a firm division between defense and civil waste. For example, there's a small amount of civilian high-level waste stored at the West Valley plant in New York and I don't think it would make a lot of sense to prohibit that from going into a repository that was developed, say, principally for high-level waste from defense. Likewise, we have civilian Three Mile Island damaged fuel in storage at Idaho National Lab, and it probably would not make sense to prohibit that material from going into a repository that the naval spent fuel from Idaho National Lab might go into. So. So I, I would think that perhaps we can have a, a, we can think about the question of specializing the purpose of repositories, but maybe not to divide it strictly by the origin of the materials. The, the, next, the next thing I'd like to note is that I also believe that it's critically important to develop a new safety standard for repositories, geological disposal facilities that is site independent. I think that we also should strive to assure that it is sufficiently flexible 
that in fact it could also be used to license a facility based on, say, deep borehole technology in addition to mine geological repository. If you develop it that way, it will be um, a performance-based type of standard, and it, you, will not, you will not have a standard that ends up actually inadvertently prescribing the method for achieving the performance as opposed to prescribing what the performance needs to be. The, the, the third thing that I'd think about, is, and this is also a rather specific point, but I think it's important, one of the important elements of being successful in siting is to pr provide appropriate and substantive incentives to those communities and states that, that would, uh, would uh, take on responsibilities for hosting facilities. The current Nucleus Policy Act actually would direct research funds preferentially. And I think, and there's been discussion with members of the, of the commission that that it's not a good idea for research awards to be awarded on criteria other than merit and capability. But I would point out that I think that it is entirely appropriate that research facilities, national user facilities, infrastructure could be directed in this way. And the example was mentioned, for example, of facilities to study the long-term performance of dry cast storage. And I'd like to see us recommend that that detail in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act be fixed because as a matter of philosophy and coming from a career of performing research, I do think it's important that we maintain this requirement that, that research really, funding for research should be awarded based on merit and on capability as opposed to where you are. Infrastructure, on the other hand, that is something that is a very different item. These would be three things that I would I would note. Just a quick comment. I, I, I meant to emphasize, and you reminded me, that that is one of the things that we've found consistently, not just in the U.S., but globally, that um, communities that receive technical facilities, research facilities, um, have in general been more receptive uh, to the location of waste facilities. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson, um, and he is a member of the Disposal Subcommittee. Another member, Commissioner John Rowe. I got to the conclusions this subcommittee reached for differing reasons than Commissioner Peterson. I still am not as optimistic as he is, but I am painfully convinced that we have tried shortcuts many times and it's the effort to make the shortcuts that is causing at least a large portion of our problem. And therefore, I think we have no choice in these matters but to trust consensual process um, and to try to work through it in great detail um, and recognizing that it is a mix of good science, good advocacy, and in the end, just plain old-fashioned dealing. I was very moved by the number of people from Nevada who said we wouldn't have been so angry if you'd have negotiated with us instead of telling us and if we'd had some chance to bargain. I can't help there, this is mostly just to tease. Uh, it's clear that R&D is too important not to do on merit, but plain old infrastructure, that we can do on cruder principles. Uh, uh, and for those, for those of us who think that professors are very mobile and iron and steel quite difficult to move, uh, I would submit that talent can be found in many places and, and they're not confined locationally. Point taken. Thank you, Commissioner Rowe. Another member of the subcommittee, Commissioner Mark Ayers. Thank you. Uh, you know, I just want to say, and, and uh, uh, Jonathan had already made the point, uh, but I guess I, I want to take it a little bit further. You know, there are so many uh, uh, talented and dedicated and technical and every other kind of person you could ever want on this subcommittee. But I have to tell you that the really talented people are the staff 
uh, that put these reports together. Uh, I mean, they're massive. It took me a week to read them, uh, but, but they're very comprehensive. So I just want to give kudos to the, to the staff because I think they really effectively captured the issues uh, that was explored by this subcommittee. Thank you very much, Commissioners. That, that is uh, important to say, and that is something I think we all truly feel, and thank you for, for saying it. Um, another member of the subcommittee, Commissioner uh, McFarland. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I guess I just want to uh, chime in and say that I think, you know, Jonathan, you, you did a great job leading us in this uh, subcommittee. I, I, um, I don't know that we'd be here without your direction. Um, but also, uh, I think uh, just one sort of question or, or observation. I think that the actual process of citing, which really isn't discussed in these recommendations, is something that we still need to elucidate further in our thinking, um, including whether you look for a voluntary community or whether you approach communities or you do both or you fail one and what's your plan B? You better have a plan B this time because we don't have a plan B now. Um, how you bring the public in, where the public participates, how they actually get to be part of this whole process. You know, yes, it's good to say it's consent-based, but what does that actually mean? How do you operationalize that? Um, what kind of technical criteria? What kind of compensation um, you provide, not just to the community or the state, but also to groups to do their own analyses? Um, this is, this is all something that we have been thinking about. Uh, I want to make that clear, and um, that we'll put a finer point on. Yes. <laughs> I can attest to uh, Commissioner Lash's leadership. I think he, was it in Sweden or Finland that uh, he had us in the back of the bus going Working. over these issues? And I, <laughs> so, you were I was captive, right? <laughs> We, we now have a, com, okay, we have Commissioner Meserve. Uh, first of all, thank you for the report. I was not on this subcommittee and it was important, to, interesting to get the report from it. A couple of uh, minor points. One is, is that, uh, uh, that I, I'm quite comfortable with your recommendations. Let me just point out that the uh, recommendation about having a, process for the facility that is adaptive and flexible that allows you to learn and change over time is something that's been encouraged as an academy, National Academy of Sciences report that's emphasized that some ago, some time ago. It is important to recognize, however, and perhaps deal with the reality that um, that is going to require some changing thinking by the NRC about how it proceeds in licensing. So it's very accustomed, it's accustomed with reactors, that there's a set of distinct requirements that are met and the licensee says, oh, he's going to meet them and you meet them and they inspect against them and you do what you said you're going to do when they verify you've done it. Uh, and having a, a more flexible, adaptive process is going to be quite foreign to the way they think about how they fulfill their regulatory responsibility. And so there is a quite an interesting and licensing challenge for them that does require a different mode of, uh, of how they approach licensing. And I just sort of flag that for the subcommittee is something that does need to be worried about if you haven't already. Um, second comment, I just, just to uh, point, and I, uh, I think I should say that there are site independent licensing standards that exist. The NRC has them in part 61, for example. Um, but the idea of revisiting them I think is very important. They were written a long time ago, and we've learned a lot since then. There's been a lot of technical advance. There's been a considerable policy advance, including policy advance that I think that is embodied in your recommendations that does require this to be re-examined. But there was, there is, there is an existing set of, of regulatory requirements that I think could definitely uh, inappropriately be revamped. The third point I'd make is a really quite a minor one, um, but you emphasized in your presentation that R&D related to disposal should be something that's funded and done by DOE and would be disconnected from the new entity. 
Um, and I can understand that that would be a valuable thing from the perspective of husbanding the waste fund to assure that it is a narrow set of purposes that are fulfilled. But I guess I do worry somewhat about the entity that is dependent on the research and has the research problems being disconnected from the process that goes out and defines the projects to be performed and the performers and is not in the direct receipt of the research results. If, if uh, I'm sure that there would be a willingness on the part of the subcommittee to respond to a set of recommendations of how to solve that problem. So the desire was not to have the new entity get diverted off into long-term research on reprocessing. Um, but at the same time, if you have to explore whether boreholes are an adequate um, option, of course the entity should be involved and, and we're open to thoughts about how to define all that. Let me go back and uh, get Commissioner Eisenhower, who is a member of the subcommittee. Uh, being a member of the subcommittee, of course, I uh, endorse the, uh, the findings that uh, were possible with, the, with Jonathan's leadership uh, in both Sweden and Finland <laughs> and many other places. I think uh, I, I would just like to say that I think one of the big challenges of our big idea, which is to establish an independent entity for the management of um, nuclear waste, uh, one of the most challenging aspects of this is going to be access to the Nuclear Waste Fund. Um, all you have to do is read the headlines in the paper every morning about the country's uh, uh, deficit reduction problems and our national debt. Um, and so I think it's going to be the challenge of this commission in the final report and also uh, as we go out to sell the ideas that we feel very strongly about to uh, emphasize um, uh, this notion of an adequate and stable source of funding and to make the case that actually uh, efficiencies uh, and uh, cost reduction will be possible by actually putting in place a system that is predictable. Um, and so this is going to be a net savings for the United States of America, not a, a raid on the federal treasury, uh, whether or not this money was always designated for this purpose or not. There is, of course, a breach of trust idea, which is, is huge, and this is what this commission has been trying to address, not only in the waste fund um, aspect, but also in, in uh, making citing recommendations. But at the end of the day, if we can't sell this as a, um, not only um, critical for uh, the continuation of a well-run nuclear program in the United States, if we can't make the case that there are also going to be cost savings, um, then we're going to have difficulty making the larger case that this is a national and energy security issue. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Eisenhower. Uh, Chairman Hamilton. I, I just want to follow up on what Susan said because I think it's important. Uh, Phil and I and Pete and Chuck have listened a thousand times to people who come to the Congress and say, I want assured access to a, uh, a fund. Uh, every manager in the federal government wants an assured access. And you can't get it. You cannot get it. Because any Congress, even if they set it up, can invade it or will invade it under budgetary pressures. So uh, I think. I'd like to hear from Pete uh, Domenici. He's had a lot of experience on the budget and maybe some real congressional budget experts here, which I'm not one, uh, of the best way to do it. Now, Susan makes the point that if we make that recommendation, we've got to put in there very, very persuasive reasons as to why it should be an assured fund. And that will give you some protection against invasion, but it doesn't, it's not permanent <laughs> because uh, what happens is that as the budgetary pressures mount, you're looking for funds of money that you can use somewhere uh, for another priority uh, or to meet uh, budget goals of some kind, caps and all the rest of it. Uh, so I think all we can do probably, Jonathan, is what Susan suggests, 
and that is say that it's terribly important for reasons of efficiency, national security, whatever the reasons are, uh, that you have such a fund and make that case as persuasively as you can. But uh, there's no guarantee here, no permanent guarantee. All right, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Sharp. Yeah, uh, just to follow on on that issue, I think it's very important that we distinguish uh, two major issues here. The first, which I indicated earlier, but I would love for us to put it clearly on the record, the money collected has been collected for this purpose. It is there in the Treasury. It is to be spent for this purpose uh, in the future and not let people get away with the idea that somehow that was collected and since it didn't get spent at the time, uh, it, it's, you know, that's all water over the dam. Uh, this is an obligation uh, that the U.S. government has like it has under Social Security and therefore it is there. Now the other issue we're talking about here is how do you get access in a timely way for the operation of, of the entity and that's a tougher uh, one. But by the way, I also have some faith that you're more likely to get timely access if, even if you don't get it a guarantee in advance if you in fact are producing real plans, real actions, real consequences. It is a lot easier to go sell to anybody in the private or public sector as opposed to just saying, well, give us money and we'll think about it and maybe next year we'll get it done. That doesn't sell anywhere. Uh, and so one of the issues for this new entity is behavior, its behavior in terms of how it approaches this. Well, I didn't mean to get off on the finances, <laughs> but I'm like Lee. Everybody wants a guarantee. Everybody wants an independent Federal Reserve until they see one, and, uh, <laughs> or they have a financial crisis. Um, but I'm all for the general proposal. Uh, <laughs> let me uh, turn to this question of public engagement, and I think they're absolutely right on target with the principles laid forth, and clearly the mistake we made in 1987 was jamming it down the throat of uh, the Nevadans. Uh, and, and one might even hope they would be interested in negotiating uh, in the future on one of more of these possible uh, propositions. Uh, and indeed, uh, there will be political turnover there as there is throughout America, and so who knows. But my point is, I, we should recognize that this has not been all for naught for the last 25 years. The Department of Energy used to get extremely bad rap. Well, I can tell you, when we went to Hanford, when we went to South Carolina, when we went to WIP, uh, we heard a different story. Now, not everybody's happy with everything, but what has happened either at the initiative of the department or because of court suit or because of governor negotiations, in each of these places there have been procedures and processes and panels developed as techniques to assure public oversight and public engagement. And I would urge us, and I think we were about, we were doing this, I'd suggested this in the previous thing, that in this chapter or somewhere, we catalog those real world ways in which uh, public engagement is occurring now, at least as information for this new entity or whomever has to do the siding. There is no need to reinvent the wheel here, uh, but also recognizing while we have general principles applicable everywhere, the truth is different communities want different ways of doing it and they have different governmental structures. So it isn't a one size necessarily fits all. The principles do, but the procedures, and we have experience in that, let's not lose it. Madam Chair, just a brief response. I, 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 your last point is a very important point. And I, I, a, a quick anecdote. In Sweden, we learned that the president and chief operating officer of the corporation went home by home in one of the communities where they ultimately facilitated the site and sat at kitchen tables to listen to people's concerns. And he learned in that process, the concerns were completely different than they expected. They were not about radiation safety. They were about the fact that thousands of workers would be brought in to construct this facility and they might be from other parts of Europe and people were concerned about the safety of their community. Uh, well, legitimate or not, they were able then to understand the, the issues they had to deal with and begin responding in a way that was considered by the community to be real instead of just the flow of propaganda. 
So I, I might add, perhaps you have another recommendation there that utility CEOs ought to go door to door with their customers <laughs> <laughs> to understand what their needs are. <laughs> All right. I <laughs> All right, I have uh, Commissioner Moniz, Commissioner Carnesol, and I think Commissioner McFarland, did you have another? But Commissioner Moniz? Do you want to I regret to say that I have a number of points again, uh, Madam Chairman. But uh, actually, I, by the way, on that last point of Jonathan's, uh, uh, these concerns being surprising, I might just add that in a very different context, the, the famous fracking issue, for example, it turns out actually one of the major concerns is simply all the heavy truck movements that comes with that kind of surface uh, 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 industry activity. So it's, it's a very important point, I think. Um, okay, so. Uh, uh, a bunch of comments. Uh, one is, I, I would urge that as you complete the report, uh, that one goes from recommendation one back to finding number zero, uh, which is uh, to, you know, based upon existing literature, especially the academy, to reinforce the scientific underpinning of long-term geological disposal. Because if you don't emphasize that, uh, the recommendations, I think, don't quite have the appropriate uh, weight. Uh, I think in doing that, a second issue comes up that I think we need to capture. Maybe it's not in a recommendation, I don't know. But that is that uh, you say geological disposal in the mine repository, dot, 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 and that's true. But I think we have to emphasize that uh, not every mine repository is the same. They have different geochemistries. That relates to the fuel forms, et cetera. The general idea that we need integrated decisions and not separate decisions. Uh, now, I don't know if that, if that works into a recommendation, but I think it's a very, very important issue, which is ultimately connected to the scientific underpinnings uh, uh, there. Um, Dick mentioned the NRC and a possible need to reevaluate kind of a regulatory approach uh, in a more responsive system. Uh, and I agree, but I would like to go back to the NRC EPA separation, and I don't know if we want to get into this, but a, but a reminder, the EPA regulations for a repository are a jury-rigged bunch, and I think uh, we might consider at least the issue of going back to that. As you know, 10,000 years got pieced on to a couple hundred thousand years, and you know, the left leg is connected to the right arm or something. I don't know. Uh, so that's another uh, uh, point. Um, I think another point that is missing, which is uh, critical for disposal, is the need to completely redo our waste classification scheme. Uh, it, uh, w this is a case where there really are orphans already, and there will be a lot more orphans running around if we, if we change fuel cycles. Uh, we need to go to a risk-based uh, system, uh, and I think that belongs here in the disposal uh, uh, section, and I think should be some recommendation, uh, which will require statutory actions uh, eventually. Um, you mentioned in the first slide uh, ethics. Uh, I'm all for ethics. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, only only to a, only to a limit. Uh, you know, uh, we're dealing with nuclear waste after all. Uh, but uh, no, but the only the the serious issue is that in fact we had a I, I thought a very good presentation to the commission uh, on intergenerational uh, issues, and uh, what we don't want to do is to promulgate the simple-minded view that intergenerational responsibility means putting the waste into a hole in your generation. Now, it doesn't say that, but I think it, it's, it's an issue that we need to be very careful uh, in defining, uh, uh, consistent with our storage recommendations and with the idea of providing options to other generations, uh, in fact. Um, fifth. 
Uh, I think the, uh, you mentioned, Jonathan, that we discussed this morning briefly the idea that the new organization uh, needs responsibilities or authorities, rather, beyond the access to the, to the waste fund. I agree. I think it needs to be, I think it deserves a higher uh, elevation. I think you have two words, institutional means, uh, in, in 2B, which may be interpreted that way. But I, but I do think we need uh, uh, more because I think it's absolutely critical. Uh, we, will, we will not have a meaningful organization if all they have is access to the waste fund. With regard to access to the waste fund, uh, Chairman Hamilton raised an issue about congressional predatory uh, uh, instincts and capabilities. Um, and uh, this is absolutely uh, tr Oh, he didn't? I, th I thought he did, right. Uh, the, the, um, uh, just a, as a note that I think there's another, another uh, analog today, actually, uh, about the value of having statutory language to kind of protect something. And that is, in, again, it's in the natural gas arena. There's something called the Royalty Trust Fund, which is a statutory assignment of a small part of federal oil and gas royalties to support research. It's in statute. Uh, the, the Bush administration and the Obama administration have both proposed zeroing it out, save $50 million a year, but frankly the statutory language then allows the supporters to much more easily protect it. Now it's still not, not bulletproof, but, uh, but I, th I think if we had statutory language it could go a long way towards protecting it, particularly with Phil's uh, caveat that the organization has to uh, perform. Uh, in that context, uh, you know, there's a leitmotif uh, through many of the discussions about DOE performance with regard to, uh, to spent fuel uh, management. I think we have been remiss in uh, assigning, uh, in, in sharing the credit with the Congress uh, for uh, what has happened over the years, and I think it's very important because, again, uh, I, th I think the fundamental error, and we've discussed this, is that uh, it provided a straitjacket for actions, uh, and that's exactly what we cannot, uh, cannot afford uh, for a, a well-functioning uh, system. The gentleman, you'll, I, just, I think it's really critical we nail that down. Yeah. Uh, several, it's been several, several times this morning, but setting rigid deadlines and designating one spot yep. turned out to have been not a shortcut, but right. it ended up jeopardizing this and putting the department and putting other players in a position where they could not perform in a way that was expected, or at least we thought was the way we wanted things to happen. And, and, and add to that the financing games, oh, yes. uh, add to that even the research restrictions yeah. on looking at alternatives. Yeah. I mean, it was a absolute narrowest set of options you could ever construct uh, within which one had no chance of, of, of success. If you don't mind, Karen, just a moment, because it's not as if everybody was stupid in making these decisions. It may seem like it now, uh, but the fact is that it was driven by the sense that we were not able to ever politically push the noodle and get decisions made. And so to help push not just the bureaucracy, but the industry and everybody else, that's why this was done as a technique to try to get decisions made. Now, that didn't right. turn out to work the way we wanted. Right. Um, Madam Chair, could I just, oh, are you finished, Ernie? Uh, no, but please, go ahead. Well, if no, you want to go now, I, uh, I have more. I have, I have brief responses to several of them, but please finish. Oh, well, then, then, then hold your powder. We'll, yeah. we'll, right. <laughs> uh, n number seven, uh, just, just as a comment on recommendation four, I strongly support uh, this idea of the cons consent-based, et cetera. But we also have to acknowledge that the political structures in the comparison cases is a lot simpler than the one we're talking about here uh, and not sugar-coated to make it uh, Look quite so easy. Right. Uh, eighth, uh, um, uh, the, this is the TRB uh, recommendation. Uh, as I s probably hinted earlier, I am concerned about layer upon layer upon layer, both outside and inside uh, the department uh, at the at the moment. But I just wonder the extent to which this was really considered uh, 
especially in the context of a new quasi-government organization. And I would just, at some point, like to hear uh, the analytical uh, reasons why that would be supportive. Uh, and finally, uh, the uh, pair raised the issue of the uh, boundaries of a defense waste uh, uh, repository. Uh, I think that's, it's a, uh, there are reasons for wanting a clean definition, uh, similar to WIP, let's say. There are also good reasons for what you raise in terms of uh, other waste and spent fuel, particularly as it sits on defense, site, uh, defense sites subject to the same <laughs> arbitrary dates that we have. So I think that's an open discussion. And uh, if the committee would like a kibitzer on that issue, I would be happy to uh, support. Thank you. So it, it will take me not more than 60 seconds. Um, I, I'm not going to respond on geology, but I think your next door neighbor may want to at some point. Um, but there certainly was no uh, misunderstanding um, in the subcommittee that all holes in the ground are the same. Um, on, on EPA, uh, if I didn't state strongly enough that we think that May I just say, Jeff, but I think even going back beyond that, I think we just need to have a banner about the status of scientific understanding. Uh, no, no, I, right. I completely take your point. And mo most of the points you made, we will just take on board. They're very good points. Um, I, I, I just didn't state as strongly as I know the committee, the subcommittee feels about the need to go back to the EPA regulations and um, a concern about the million year standard and, and so forth. Uh, on ethics, um, we did have, we do have a good discussion of those issues in the context of retrievability, but didn't apply it um, more broadly in the context of storage. You're entirely right. I think, I suspect there's complete agreement with what you said. Um, we, we will try to better articulate the powers uh, that are necessary. I think the report, the full draft of the committee report is pretty clear that Congress shares uh, the parentage of the problems, uh, but if not clear enough, we'll work on it. No, that's, that's true. It's buried. That's uh, correct. We will go back to the, the issue of the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board um, and either be clearer or back away. Right. And may I just repeat, I think, I think this issue, I don't know if the committee addressed it, but the issue of the need of a sensible waste classification scheme. Uh, I skipped over that one. Apparently, um, your committee's draft, the the uh, reactor and fuel cycle committee, will have material on that rather than our committee. No. All right, we're going to move on to Commissioner Connorsal. Well, <laughs> okay. I guess we will. In in the interest of time, and to differentiate myself from Commissioner Moniz, I'm only going to do my 73rd point. Um, <laughs> And it relates, <laughs> it relates uh, to what you passed over that you hadn't yet decided about the question of the veto of the states. Uh, and I'd like to get a little clarification. Uh, looking at the Nevada experience, I could understand where this might have uh, arisen. And it, I can understand it with regard to a disposal site. But the transportation question is one that raises itself. And I think of the case, I think of the whip case that was just uh, raised, the calls bad might have been happy, but you may not have somebody in the Senate that can get the money to build a rather substantial road to bypass your equivalent of Santa Fe. Um, and I don't know what other communities might be affected in that way. And so it seems to me that somehow other communities that would be strongly represented, that need to be represented, that might otherwise be represented by their state have to be represented somehow, and if not by the state, then by whom? The point is, is noted. Could All I, right. Um, Al, uh, actually, Commissioner uh, McFarland had a, yep. an okay. additional comment. Yeah, just uh, a quick response to um, Commissioner Reserve's excellent point that it's going to be difficult to continue the usual NRC type of evaluation if you're doing this phased, uh, staged approach. Um, that's exactly right, and it's going to be difficult to do any kind of quantitative, fully, entirely quantitative assessment because you need to know 
all the design features and everything ahead of time and you're not going to necessarily know that if you do a staged approach, which makes a strong argument for developing a safety case instead of just relying on performance assessment. Thank you, Commissioner McFarland. Commissioner Rowe. I apologize I'm get for out of that adding angle. what I'm afraid is merely whimsy, but I've been sitting here in frustration over the obvious relevance of Chairman Hamilton's comments about the difficulty of, of binding one Congress with another. It seems to me that there ought to be institutional vehicles whereby Congress could put money it has collected from my customers in a box and make it at least hard for individual appropriators to get back at the box. And it occurred to me that this commission is not to talk about putting nuclear waste into Yucca Mountain, but perhaps we could put the money in Yucca Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an excellent note to end on. Uh, 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 oh, all right, Commissioner Sharp. Just, that's just the a, last one. Honest a reminder <laughs> of a lot of testimony that we got. As it's critical to have local input, that we were reminded over and over by a number of people we should state clearly this is in the national interest. This is a national problem in which the national government must take a lead and which we must find a solution. And so. Uh, this is not to override states and not to override local communities, but this stuff has to transport through lots of geography at now or at some point in the future. And, uh, and so we mustn't fail to state the importance of this as a national proposition in hopes of also appealing to the general patriotism and understanding of, of people which actually exists in many communities. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, please extend our thanks to Chuck as well. Uh, and we will look forward to your full report. Uh, let me express my appreciation to Vicki. I've asked her to fill in here on very short notice, and I think she's done an excellent job. Vicki, we thank you very much for that. And then uh, we will take a five-minute break and then uh, go to Chairman Peterson for the, the, the public comment. There are 16 people on the list. Uh, they will be given three minutes each. And then we will conclude, as several of you have uh, emphasized to me, at 4.30.